Okay, so there's, there's a ton of literature on the psychology of decision, ma decision making. It's fascinating. Uh, this has been sort of a little bit of a hobby of, of mine. And, and in particular, when I meet uh, executives in, in pharma, talking to them about their decision process. Um, but if you're interested, there's, there's a bunch of, of, of great references here. Of course, uh, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for Economics for his work in um, decision making and all of the heuristics and biases. And he's still publishing on it today. The, you know, so there's some great stuff there. Um, so you, you can look at those. What I've done is I've, and, and I'm by no means an expert in this stuff, but these are things that hit me as I was reading the, some of that content and how it, it influences decisions. We'll start with that. Then in a minute, we'll talk about how does it influence drug development decisions. Um, but one of, the, one of the interesting things that uh, has been shown through uh, decision-making um, psychology studies, uh, let's start on the far left here, individuals versus groups. The performance of a group is usually not quite as good as the most informed individual in the group. So you have a little bit of a, of a regression to the mean effect there. So that, you, know, you might have somebody on that team who really knows the topic. They know the decision. But now they've got to balance that with all the other inputs and assumptions and so on. And the performance of the group is typically less solid than the best individual. Uh, there's a scenario where that improves, and I'll, and I'll go back to that afterwards. Um, structure versus and process. Um, you know, th this kind of, kind of is obvious, but organizations with formal decision process and structure make better decisions. Uh, and you can see, you know, if you if you go into this and you don't understand the question, you start start trying to solve it. But but maybe you have a formal process of first define the question, understand what that question is. You know, you're going to get a better answer. So that's kind of that's kind of obvious. A recent Kahneman publication was talking about precision. So the, his early work was all about biases in decision making, or it was heavily uh, ad addressing biases. But his n newer thesis here is that maybe the, the imprecision or inconsistency in organiza organizational decision making is worse than the biases. Uh, in that, you know, you can give the same team the same scenario, and they're going to make a different decision over different repeated uh, applications. Now, that, who knows why, right? Is, is, that, is that just because you have a more vocal member that's there one time or the other? Or is it because somebody had actually learned something else, but they haven't really acknowledged the fact? So there's more that needs to die, you need to dive into that. Um, and that's why being very quantitative and transparent about the factors influencing a decision, decision are important. But if you can't count on a team making the same sort of decision, you know, imagine a drug development team or, or governance body that's deciding we're, we're moving on to late stage development and they're gonna make a decision one way this month, a different way next month. How does the portfolio group, how can they count on that information to know what, what's coming forward and, and what's not? So he, he points that out as a big, as a big problem. Biases, there, there are tons of biases in decision making. Um, you know, you, the, um, I'm, I'm blanking on some of the particular names, but one of them is sort of the substitution bias. So you, you're familiar with a fact. What is that? Availability is, is also, yeah, so if what's, what's, what's available in your knowledge base or your experience? You know, you've seen a scenario, you know, you heard about the shark story, and uh, that was really important for survival for those people who fell in the water, but that's not relevant to this story because you're in the boat. So, um, you know, it's, that, that's, that's a particular bias that can, that can evolve there. Um, these biases impact uh, intuition-based decision-making. Um, and it's another reason why the, the last piece I thought was really relevant to what we do is that objective, data-driven, scenario-driven decision-making uh, outperforms all of these things. And it even takes, remember that first group when I said that uh, the most well-informed individual does better than the group? Well, when you do the scenarios, the group does as well as the most informed individual. So, you know, that, that's a big plug for us to do uh, simulation-based evaluation of decision paths and, and, and explore those sorts of things. Um, the other thing, too, that, that I don't have listed here directly, but goes back to uh, Amit's point earlier, is that an, an understanding of the causal inference. So there was one fact that I gave you that gave you an understanding of the causal inference. What, what fact is that? Time to rescue. Time to rescue, right? Time to rescue is the most important predictor of survival. 
that's the that's the causal re relationship in all of this. So all these other things are ways to get rescued faster, right? So, you know, if you didn't understand that, and you said, "Well, mirror, what, what's a mirror going to do, or what's, what's the petrol going to yeah. do, right?" But then you start thinking, "Okay, how can I get rescued faster?" Yeah. So, so the causal understanding is key to making better decisions in teams too. And and again, you know, that's where the scenario analysis comes into play too. Um, you know, we see this. Uh, all the time when you're working with a development team and you're building maybe an interactive simulator, they don't understand the model, right? They don't, have, they don't really know the causal relationship, the, the, the predictive variables versus the dependent variable. But when they start playing around with the scenarios, they start to understand, uh, if I tweak the lever this way, this is what happens. If I move it the other way, this is what happens. And so they get a better understanding of the causal relationship and, and should lead to better decisions. Um, so these are just some of them. There's, there's a ton of, of literature on here, but these are kind of some of the things that really lit up in my mind when I was reading this sort of stuff. And then Jonathan helped me with this too. We, we were talking through through a bunch of, of uh, these concepts that are that are well understood in decision making psychology. We're just thinking about well, how does that impact what we do on a daily basis? So I want to get a little bit more from you now. We've got a small sample size here, obviously. Uh, and maybe we can just quickly run through this the survey. And as I'm running through stuff. Feel free to just you know uh, in, interject and, and and talk about the experience in your organization. This is helpful to all of us to understand you know where do we stand because it, you know unless you've worked in multiple companies and, and even if you have things change uh, you know wh what's the process really like so you know mostly large and medium pharma. Yeah, I'm you also signed an unblinding plan when you registered. So uh, mostly medium large, mostly hands on M and S clinical pharmacology um, in the group. Uh, yeah. So no, no. This so this question is the decision making process in your organization, and then uh, is there an institutionalized, a formal process to making decisions for all these different types of decisions? Um, so let's just look at maybe the, if there's any extremes in, in the mix here. Not so much. It looks like the things that's mostly formalized is phase one clinical trials. Um, transition to, to the clinic too, um, which, yeah, that's not surprising, right? Yeah. Uh, but when we look at transition to later stage, maybe a little less. Um, yeah, I mean, low health economics decisions. Um, what else is low? That's probably the lowest one. Um, you know, and the dose sort of stuff, clinical pharmacology is pretty high to here too. So not, not too surprising there. Yeah, in a recent conversation I had with someone who's, who's got a uh, higher level leadership in, in a pharma company, uh, the comment was made, you know, those people in portfolio management, they do their quantitative analyses, but they don't test assumptions. They just assume that everything that's fed to them is fact. And, you know, and th that's where this whole, you know, imprecision in decision making or, you know, or your projection could be way off, but it's just checking the box, delivering the, the, the information. But they, they believe that, yeah, you're, you're qualified. You're doing that accurately. We can count on this information. You know, is that, always, is that always the case? This is the model based. So the first was just a formal structure. This is actually model based structure. And of course, the Clin Farm dose stuff is pretty high. Um, lowest would, and would be, and it might be lack of uh, familiarity with that too, because we don't have many people from these groups in our, in our audience today, but health economics, therapeutic, uh, therapeutic area alignment, and company-wide portfolio alignment. Um, I, I'm betting that the, those are, some of those are quantitative, but that, that you're yeah. just not interacting with them. And then this is um, challenges to implementing model, modeling simulation-based decision-making in your organization. One being not, not a challenge, and five, very challenging. Um, so the, I'm going to have to hover over these to see what these are. So decision makers, come on, can I get that? I forget, <coughs> I forget that, what that was. Oh, decision makers uncomfortable with m &S. That's pretty high. Uh, organization, no formal organization for, for, for applying modeling simulation. Um, Difficulty in developing, sorry guys. Michelle, do you know how I get these topics? Oh, there it is, okay. I'm just gonna hover in the right place. Maybe go, maybe go on the... Uh, yeah, difficulty in developing m and strategies to support decision-making, uh, lack of qualified scientists, so then of course that's pretty high. 
something a little lower, lack of computational resources, uh, no budget allocated. That doesn't seem like it was too bad. So it seems like there's budget for doing this, but there's no formal process. That doesn't go together. Insufficient tools, nobody agrees with that. The big one here is not enough time. Not enough time allocated for MNS yeah. and typical development programs. You know, and that goes back to the, if you read the session before and an idea we'll talk about today is not not backloading this stuff, actually changing the way we resource so that we're prepped up front for this. Um, that'll be a discussion. See how viable that might be. Okay, so thanks for doing that. Uh, obviously, we got a small sample size here. Um, what, I, what I'd really love is, um, should we do a survey or just like email back to, we'll, we'll have a follow-up to this. And if you have ideas to improve that survey or if there'll be some more focused questions before we unleash this a little more broadly, um, we'd, we'd love your input. And who knows, maybe we'll, we'll write a blog or even a, a white paper about this at some, at some point. So you know, if you want to participate in that, uh, please volunteer. <laughs> uh, okay, so we did that. All right, so next, um, some big ideas, maybe not so big ideas. And, and some of these you've probably heard about. We're going to introduce a few, five different ideas. And what I'd like you all to do then, and you could do it in the same teams that you're in, or you could actually, what we'll have you do is, is go to the idea that you're most interested in or most comfortable with. But I, I want you to tear it apart and see, you know, what, what would it take to do this? Is this some feasible? Is it a crazy idea? Um, not good for this? Or we've already got it solved? That sort of thing. So let's look at these big ideas. I mean, one is, this is a pretty uh, straightforward one, opportunity at the intersection. And this is about the intersection between domain expertise and quantitative analysis. So every company has extensive domain expertise within each of the domains. The decision making is usually siloed in, in each of those uh, domains. However, we're using quantitative methods across domains. It could be potentially the link across these. And so how, what are those opportunities to look across silos? And these are just some of the areas here. You can imagine the, the different um, uh, domain areas that might benefit from working together quantitatively to address decisions in one or the other or both of the, of the domains. So here's an example. Um, this is a combination of quantitative systems pharmacology and uh, health economics. Um, this paper is focused on a cost, cost effective analysis for denosumab um, to prevent skeletal events in patients with multiple myeloma. So there's, there's a mathematical model. It's, it's a typical um, sort of transit probability model. Um, and uh, when you look at uh, the predictors here, this, the tornado plot, you know, the way you look at this is the one, the broadest band is the most influential uh, down to those that are least influential. So this is a, a uh, health economics analysis of the data set. You see that, you know, something that's pretty important here is the crude um, uh, skeletal related events rate, so fracture rate. That, that's really important here in the, in the economic question. Uh, and then, you know, looking at uh, one of the bisphosphonates versus no treatment at all number of, of administrations and cycle of denosumab. So these are rank order, but they're, they're you know, these are things that we, we might have some knowledge about at, at, at a phase in development, particularly uh, if we could predict fracture rate. So, um, and I picked this one because we have a lot of familiarity with this um, in, in a multi-scale model of, of bone calcium homeostasis, which is also linked to fracture rate. Uh, so imagine a scenario now that you're early in um, development. Maybe it's your proof of concept study. Maybe you're even just working on biomarkers uh, in phase one. You got a systems model that, that can then take that, translate those biomarkers to bone mineral density, and then make some prediction of fracture rate. So you've got the major input in that health and economics model. You can have some, some projection around. Sure, it might have some uncertainty, but you have some, some knowledge of that. Plug it into the health economics model then make an assessment as, well, what's, what's the economic benefit of this? What are we likely to be able to, to sell to third party payers it, when we get there? You know, right now you're at phase one. There might be some adjustments there for time and for competitors in the market and so on. But you could make a, a phase one or phase two projection of what the potential benefit would be for, from a health economics point of view. Maybe even make that a formal part of your target product profile or, or you know, stage gate decision. 
Uh, so that's one way you could, you could go with this. Um, you could imagine going the other way and saying, well, we're at the end here. You know, um, is there benefit to a different uh, dosing schedule in patient population that might give us better control over, over or less fluctuation in bone markers? You know, it, would there be a, a, an economic benefit to that? So you could see it feeding backwards, too. Um, so this is just one, one example. Do you get, get the flavor of the idea here? So th this is a collaboration across, across domains that don't normally, or maybe in some companies they do work together, but, but maybe not, not so much. Th so the key there was that the quantitative side is what links us together. You know, we might not be domain experts, but, but we, can, you know, we can understand, even though it might not be our particular expertise or, or um, in, in a particular methodology, th there's enough of an understanding there to cr create some common ground to start building these. The second um, big idea is the model-based decision criteria. This is the one that I talked about in the prior session. Uh, but the whole idea behind this is that, you know, how many times in your organization have you gotten to the point of a proof of concept study, for example? And, you know, maybe there's some, some target effect size with a confidence interval on it that you're using to guide what's going next. Maybe, maybe it's just a p-value for, you know, for an underpowered study, but there's some decision criteria criterion, maybe several criteria. You run the study, it lands someplace, and then we change the criteria to adjust the, the, the decision, right? Or, or you're, you're going forward on a, cri a criterion that is irrelevant to what you want to do with patients, right? You, know, you can't run the, you know, an all, this is an Alzheimer's disease study. You can't run the Alzheimer's disease proof of concept study, but maybe you could, you know, maybe you could run a shorter study and then inform a model. So the, the general idea is to, is to make decisions on quantities that are absolutely relevant to what you care about. The, the target product profile, the, the, the you know, ultimate treatment effect, the, the cost benefit ratio, whatever it is, the thing that you care about. Not the thing that you're studying in the study, but use that study to inform a model-based projection of, of the thing you care about. And of course, this requires some prior knowledge and requires, you know, but, but you're going to do that anyway, subjectively, right? You've got a, a, a POC study that's pretty much underpowered. You got some endpoint that's not really the clinical endpoint and you're going to decide to move forward. How does that translation get made? That's a lot of intuition, right? And, and you know, why not quantify it? Why not take all of that and, and make a projection? So that's, that's the other idea here. What, what about moving to model-based assessments of decision criteria rather than a trial outcome um, which, which usually gets reinterpreted post hoc anyway. Right, this is the other uh, one, uh, Danielle. Simulate all, all the trials. <laughs> but I love it, you know. yeah, sure. But let's think of it from the other side. Like just, just a very practical point of view. We're, we're always doing everything so reactively, right? We don't even start programming data until after database lock is is complete and. Uh, Nobody's even thought about models. They're not, they haven't thought about the simulation they're going to run with the model. Effort. I, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but the, we could move all of that way up front. And it could be at the time of pr protocol writing, you build a model that captures your best understanding of the system. You build data sets and data programming that maps the, the real database to, to programming. You get that all in place. You have all of your outputs delivered. You build your simulation app or your report or whatever you're going to deliver. You do it, you do a dry run all before the start of the study. And then, you know, maybe to accelerate things, you find a way uh, to get access to data in an interim or, you know, some of the data is unblinded, you know, if you really want to accelerate. But, but if you do all that other stuff and you've done it accurately, so you really need a lot of organizational coordination there, uh, I believe, but you, I want to hear from you on that. Um, then you, can, then you can turn around and deliver a model-based analysis or a model-based projection of some decision uh, around the time that the decision's being made, uh, rather than after the decision's been, been made. Uh, and so wh what do you think about that? I mean, is that, is that just too much of, a, of an organizational overhaul? Uh, or, or could we just say, forget about it. We're not going to resource the next filing as heavily from a model point of view. We're going we're gonna to gear up on the early stuff for the next com compound if, if your resources are limited. I, I know. I know. Filings always take precedent. But um, the next one is is about um, you know interactive scenario evaluation. So it's that whole idea of simulation, but being able to run simulations, real simulations during the, the time course of a discussion with the development team. 
I'm not talking about pre-populating results, but I'm talking about building an engine uh, that allows you to explore questions as it's being discussed. Uh, and you know, I think I've, some of you have seen this slide before, but it's this whole cycle of you get typically you you do this iteratively, right? You talk to the team, you come up with a modeling scenario, you come, you present some results. They say, okay, uh, let's add some more scenarios, or I thought we were going to do this, uh, and then you go back to the drawing board, do it again. So instead. You, instead of building that, you build a tool that encompasses all of the factors that, that the decision makers would like to assess. You tie that together with a fast simulator and, and you know, unlimited cloud computing so you can run it pretty quickly. You know, maybe you've come up with some strategies to make that efficient. And, you know, and um, this example might use Shiny as a front end, but you use some graphical front end so that the um, decision makers are looking at a scenario that they understand. It's, it's viewed in their terms, uh, and then they can they can play with it from there. Um, and you could also d use this same uh, idea for the thing that Jonathan was talking about before, uh, the, the pre-simulation decision criteria, that, all that sort of thing. That could be done interactively. You could run simulations live there if you, as long as you know the scope within which you want to explore. And then related to that is this whole idea of the you know, d being able to deliver those results uh, through, through interactive simulation um, and also the intersection, the innovation at the intersection across disciplines. One of the things that's missing is not only are the decisions siloed, but so are the analytics and the data. Uh, and so, you know, you might have health economics, they have access to one database, you, you know, uh, PKPD has another database. Uh, they, one runs on a desktop Windows machine, the other one's in a cloud-based cluster, whatever. They don't talk to each other, there's no way to do that. So, you know, I, I, we believe really strongly in this idea that, you know, creating a unified platform um, that is, you know, available to all of, of the quantitative groups in the company, uh, we breaking down the silos, use the same data structures at least, so maybe not the same database, but you pull and push the same way. Um, and, and then deliver models from one group to the next seamlessly uh, in a reproducible research environment. So that, I mean, I, we feel really strongly that this is, a, this is feasible and, and a good way to go. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up here. Um, I, I thought, you know, we talked a little bit about next steps, um, but, you know, maybe we can move that to our reception, talk about maybe what we could do next. Is there interest in, in you know, writing a position paper? Is there interest in, in doing another workshop? Um, I, I don't know. What, what, what do we do? What are the, who are the partners we need to make? Uh, do we need to learn more uh, internally about what's going on with respect to decision making in different companies? Um, how do we engage the community? So let, let's maybe bring that part of the conversation uh, to the reception. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, you all were really uh, very energetic, engaged. I'm, I'm so impressed. Um, appreciate your time and, uh, and your input. Thanks. Thanks for a popular session. Yeah.